Hey my friends, it's your old pal Jordan the Lion. How are you all doing today? I hope you said well. Today we're in Dayton, Ohio and we are going to the grave of true Hollywood screen royalty. But not only a movie star, not only a TV star, also a radio star, a horror star, a comedy star, a drama star. This woman did everything and actually was someone who Vincent Price himself called the true queen of horror. We're going to the grave today of the great Agnes Moorhead. But we're not in Hollywood or anywhere like that. We're actually here in Dayton, Ohio, and I'm going to tell you why she's buried here, a little bit about her life, some controversy, and just about how amazing she really was. Days with Jordan the Lion, it begins right now. Okay. And it seemed like it was kind of off straight to the back, wasn't it? Yeah. Last time I was in town, we came out here with Scott Michaels so he could, you guys get a laugh out of this if you know Scott Michaels over at Dearly Departed. He looked and looked to find her in here just so he could get a photo of himself in front of the, the grave site so that he could do the disappearing thing. And when he made that video, he told me it took him like over an hour. It was driving him crazy. <laughs> but it's so funny to think that he wanted to come all the way out here just so he could do like a little like three second video <laughs> that he would post on Instagram. She's not in here, but I just always thought this was really cool when we drove past it last time. The architecture and everything of it. She's in the mausoleum here in the back. Perfect timing. Hopefully it's open. Here we are at the Memorial Abbey. She was born in Massachusetts and her father was a traveling minister. So he was stationed or parsonaged at various different places. So. She ended up being raised in St. Louis, but she loved to sing from the time she was a little girl. Her mom taught her to sing and she actually loved to perform. So she had read the Lord's Prayer on stage when she was three years old. And she would end up eventually promising her dad that she would go get further higher education. So she went and became a teacher but she always loved acting, so she ended up moving to New York and ended up enrolling in the American Academy of Dramatic Arts and was extremely good. She actually had some of the highest scores they ever had. I believe she ended up teaching even there, but it was during the time here. She wasn't finding enough roles on stage, so she had to get a job, but then realized that there was radio. And so she started trying out for radio and was getting a lot of work. She was actually sometimes doing two or three shows a day and developed this great character acting through her voice on there. And she made popular, um, it was called Sorry Wrong Number. It was a play that um, the whole thing was based around her answering a phone call and then finding out that the phone call was the person coming to kill her and it was so popular that throughout her life they would bring it back and bring it back to the stage numerous times over decades and she always was the star of it and it was because of this that um, Orson Welles found out about her and he loved her work in this so much so that he actually said that that play that was the greatest piece of writing he had ever believed was ever written and it's actually, I think, with the Library of Congress been considered that as well. But she became a star from that, and he invited her to become one of the members of the Mercury Theater with Joseph Cotton and himself. 
So the Mercury Theater was a real life-changing event because that was when they did the radio show of War of the Worlds. And when that came out, people believed that that was for real. They actually thought that the radio show was happening and that it was that people were having pandemonium all over the world. And but it was like before 911, so uh, fire stations, all kinds of um, public phone lines were getting calls of people asking what's going on, where to escape to, created so much pandemonium and she was doing all the screaming. You could hear people screaming in the background of this radio broadcast and she was doing that stuff and uh, it was just so popular or so grabbed the world so much so that they had to actually come out the next day and confess that yes, this was a radio program, this wasn't for real and RKO was so impressed by how much attention this got that they gave Orson Welles a deal to make a movie. And that movie turned out to be Citizen Kane. And who did he cast to play the mother of Citizen Kane? Wonderful Agnes Moorhead. That was basically his Mercury Theater people that he cast in that movie and then used the same cast to be in his follow-up, The Magnificent Ambersons, and, uh, and they ended up, when they finished that movie, um, it, it won a lot of awards, but the studio took it out of Orson Welles' hands and actually edited it out like an hour's worth of footage um, and made it the movie that it, that it became. But through that, MGM found out about Agnes and they offered her a contract. They did a week's worth of screen testing, I believe she said in an interview, and they had her do everything from an old woman to, um, a teenager to someone who was losing their mind. They just put her through screen tests of a little bit of everything and found out that yes, indeed, she could do just about anything. Now she was uh, married twice and her second marriage, she ended up walking in and catching her husband cheating on her. And now that became something that has followed her life till the end because her co-star on Bewitched, many years later, Paul Lind on stage in a comedy act would say that Agnes walked in on her husband cheating on her and said, if you can have a mistress, so can I. And that was just, you know, a comment that he made. But over the years, it was um, kind of recounted and people interpreted that to mean that Agnes was a lesbian. And so then the, that, that has just been one of those things that has always been a rumor attached to her everywhere you look online. And Debbie Reynolds was her best friend and Debbie Reynolds said, if I, anyone would have known it would have been me because I spent hours upon hours hanging out and talking to her on the phone. She said, no, the, the truth about Agnes was that she loved her work more than anything in the world. She loved being an actress and that's what she spent all of her time doing. If she wasn't filming a TV show or a movie, she was preparing for the next one that she was going to do. So Agnes was so good, she was making appearances on TV shows and especially one of my favorites and one of the ones I thought was, showed a lot of how great she really was, was her Twilight Zone where she doesn't say anything through the whole episode. The whole episode is her reacting to the space invaders that keep popping into her house or outside of her door. And she did, like I said, the entire episode where she doesn't say anything. Now, she started making movies and TV and just working constantly, um, sometimes 20 to 30 movies and projects per decade. And then in the mid 60s, they came and offered her the, the part of Endora for Bewitched, but she decided she didn't want to do it. The reason she didn't want to do it was because she felt like it would take up too much of her time. For one thing, she liked to do all the projects. She liked to be doing different things. And she figured she wouldn't be able to do stage TV and movies and all that stuff if she was always um, tied down to one project, which would have been a TV show that you had to rehearse every week. So she said she didn't want to do it. And what ended up changing her mind was she ran into Elizabeth Montgomery in a department store a couple weeks later and Elizabeth Montgomery said, I was the one that recommended you for that because I just love your work so much. I wanted, I wanted so bad to work with you. And apparently Agnes Moorhead said, well, how can I turn it down if that's the case? So she agreed to do it, but she wanted it put in the contract that she didn't have to be in all the episodes so she could go and do everything else because she actually thought that um, 
since this was kind of a novelty concept that it wouldn't be very popular and that she would just do it once and um, and that would be it you know like one season and then it ended up lasting for her I think 120 something episodes so she ended up doing quite a lot of it and um, and like I said one of the things that was life-changing for her as you see next to her, I pointed out that her sister's here her sister when her sister committed suicide that was what made um, Agnes decide to change her path from being a teacher and going into wanting to do stage performing because she realized just how short life truly was. Now here's the sad thing about Agnes Moorhead's life is that she made a movie called The Conquerors with uh, John Wayne and Susan Hayward and apparently there, there's a rumor that now People believe that it was that movie that gave Agnes Moorhead uterine cancer, that gave John Wayne cancer. That apparently they filmed on a plot of land that's now a no-go zone because of radiation. And of the 200 plus people that were on the cast and crew, almost 100 of them have come down with cancer. And, um, and uh, three quarters of them, I believe, at the last count had died from it. So. Agnes was known for numerous things, doing Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte and Bewitched. Like I said, she was doing comedy. She did all this stuff, but shortly after Bewitched ended, that's when she started to feel something different and found out that she had this cancer. So she ended up, you might wonder why she buried in Dayton. It's because her father was last uh, person here. And so there he is, Reverend John Henderson Moorhead and her mother right here, Mary, was living here at the time. So when Agnes became extremely sick, she came back to Dayton and lived with her mother and her mother took care of her. And, um, and then when Agnes knew that she was basically going to die, she made Debbie Reynolds the executive of her will. And Todd, Todd Fisher tells in his book that Agnes was extremely concerned that um, that her estate would somehow end up in the wrong hands. She, so she hired lawyers to make it ironclad so that her mother would get everything. And Agnes had a home in Beverly Hills, had all kinds of money, the residuals from Bewitched. And she said that she knew even though her mother would never live in her house in Beverly Hills, she wanted, you know, she knew she would sell it and she would never have to worry about another thing in her life. And Debbie Reynolds said that when Agnes passed away and they read the will, the first and last page she recognized and she didn't recognize anything in the middle. And she said that uh, the lawyers of Agnes Moorhead ended up inheriting next to everything. Um, Elizabeth Montgomery received one piece of jewelry. Uh, Agnes's mother received all the furniture in the house but the house itself, everything in the house other than the furniture and the residuals to Bewitched all went to Agnes's lawyer. So apparently Agnes's mother asked Debbie to sell the furniture for her. The furniture was sold and Agnes's mother ended up with about, I think they said $30,000. How sad is that, you know? So she's laid to rest right here with the rest of her family. And you'll also notice that her mother lived until 1990. Her mother lived to be 106. But right at the end of Agnes's life, um, she ended up being taken out to Minnesota to the Mayo Clinic. And I believe she passed away at the Mayo Clinic and then was brought here and buried here. One of the true greats of the screen. This fell down, I'm trying to see if we can find a way to put that back up there. And she did say that she got a bad rap as far as um, there was like a rumor that she didn't like Dick Sargent when he replaced Dick York. And she said that wasn't true. She just, she didn't like that they replaced him when he could still work. 
And she said she just thought that that rumor of people thinking that she didn't like him came about because um, other than the director of Bewitched, she was the only cast member that ever went and visited Dick York in the hospital. Well, my friends, I think that's going to do it for us today. Hope you enjoyed this vlog, and if you were an Agnes Moorhead fan, didn't think you'd ever make it to Dayton, Ohio to see your grave, I hope this made it extra special for you. Thank you all for watching, and uh, we'll see you all next time. Have a great night, and goodbye.